All right, let's get the ball rolling. Welcome, welcome everybody to the YFS Academy live office hours and Q&A session. Full disclaimer, let's just get right into it before I forget. This is not financial advice. This is just two knuckleheads with their own opinion on things about finances. Please do your own due diligence, even though I'm very opinionated and I study this stuff a lot. That does mean you should do everything I say that I'm going to say on this particular show. Did that cover it? That covered it. I covered it. I'm pretty sure my lawyer wants a little bit more legalese than that, but I'm an idiot, people. And that's all you should say. I'm an idiot. And I got to do my research before I do anything that Dom says to do. I think that covers it there. How you been, man? I've been good. And anything that I touch on health wise, I'm not a medical professional. I'm just giving my my tidbit of advice from my own health, um, my own health journey um, and things that I find out that work for me. Uh, so again, it is just my bit of advice. It is not medical or, you know, medical professional advisement to follow behind exactly what I say, but do your research. So it's kind of like that commercial where it says, you know, um, I'm not a doctor, but I stayed at the holiday Inn express. <laughs> like, like uh, I'm probably dating myself. They don't do that one no more, huh? Holiday and express. Yo. All right. So be- before we start, I did have a question. And, and this is for, for you and everybody else. Why didn't y'all tell me that Ratchet books are way better than Ratchet TV? I need y'all, to know y'all should have told the people me too. Like, it is way better, bro. Like, I'm like I'm not even going to hold you. I was reading James Clear's book on, you know, I, I reread, I reread his book. I read, I read books maybe two or three times because, you know, after you read it the first time, you you read it third time, you really pick something up and things start to stick. Yep. But then I start going into like the little, the the, the weird books, like uh, the Quan Mills books, Google them, Amazon, Amazon him. You'll see like the titles of these books are hilarious. Like, oh, this person got roaches or oh, my auntie stinks, stuff like that. They are, hilarious. <laughs> these books are so funny, dog. Oh my God. They way better than Ratchet TV in the, like, I'm mad that y'all didn't tell me about it a little bit sooner, but either way, um, how you been, man? So I'm in, I'll, I'll, let me just answer the question for you. You seem like you're looking healthier. You seem like things are going better for you. Is that true? That is, that is very true. So I'll be very So you honest. got the arm up. Like you've been working out a little bit. Like I, just, I see I you just got, got the... finished knocking up right before the call and had to, <laughs> had to swole up real quick. You know what I'm saying? But no, nah, in all seriousness, um, I think right after the, the holidays, I had I had really set set still with myself. I think I had been moving around for the past two years of like recovery. So I decided at the start of the year to kind of just slow down and really be in tune with my body, uh, which really I, I explained to a lot of people that the physical recovery of it up from the, the stroke was easy for me but the mental aspect was was a lot harder than than the physical for me so um I was dealing with some some moderate depression and PTSD from from the the stroke Mm -hmm. um that I was working through and uh so disclaimer here I as I mentioned on a couple of other episodes that I I tried to go to I went go the holistic route So I tried some some medicines and every time they seem to like alter my personality and how I'm feeling. So um, and that happened recent. So I decided to just stop taking everything and get back to a um, more natural approach, just doing natural things to boost my mood and, and energy and things like that. So I've been feeling like a thousand times better since I did at the beginning of the year. So let me ask, do you do do you meditate or do anything like that as well? Like, oh, like yeah. what's your routine? What's your routine for winding down? And because I, I think this will help a lot of people. Right. So what's your routine for if you're feeling anxious? How do you get yourself to calm down and get back into your zone to realize that everything is OK? Like, what is that routine for you? So when I feel myself getting uneasy, so I try to start the day. I attack the day with as soon as I get up, take care of hygiene and I'll go. We have a Zen room here. So I'll go in and I'll sit in there for at least 10 minutes. So I dedicate at least 10 minutes to a a meditation before I get the day started to try to align and make sure the energy in my mind is right. Uh, Throughout the day, if I feel that way, 
what what I then do is I just kind of take a break from what I'm doing, put it down, go meditate again. Um, and also what I notice is that aromatherapy is very helpful for me. So I, I'll light a candle or some essential oils um, because smells seem to lavender, the peppermint um, and things like what, that. What you, what you use? You say lavender. I got tea tree. I got some jasmine, orange, nutmeg, spearmint. Which one you use for your essential oils? I use lavender um, at nighttime during the oh, day. That's going to put you to sleep. Yeah. So, uh, during the day, I'll use a tea tree or peppermint um, just to just I'm for try focus. That tomorrow. Um, peppermint really helps me to lock in and stay focused. So um, and then I'll meditate. And then as um not many of you know, but my wife practices yoga. So I'll do, I'll do some yoga sessions with her. Um, or I'll use the Peloton yoga sessions just to help me, um, just to help stay grounded. Hmm. I probably need to do more of that. Every time I meditate, my mind starts to drift off into other stuff that I need. I feel as though I need to be doing instead of being within self. So how do you, how did you, how long did it take you to get past that point of thinking of random stuff as you're meditating? Uh, it took it took a while because, you know, and when you first get on the mat, your mind is, OK, I got this to do. I have that to do. I need to I should be doing this. But after a while, I, I really just started to preach to myself that it's OK to take, you know, 15, 20 minutes just to be with myself. Um, and as I started to do that, I'll, I'll think that as my mind is may drift, I'll think that, hey, this is my time. So and try to just stay in control in control of it um, while I'm meditating or while I'm doing yoga. I love that, man, because a lot of people think that they especially if you look at Instagram or TikTok, we talked about this a couple of times where people think they need to go, 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 go. Right. They, they think they need to keep leveling up like life and stuff is a video game and when you sit down and be still and you be calm and you actually think about the journey a lot is revealed in that in itself and you might come to realize that I do have more than enough or I need to focus on these other things that make me fulfilled versus the hustle and bustle in the race because once yeah. again there's always going to be more somebody with more money it's always going to be somebody bigger stronger faster but you kind of got to be within self with it so I like them I don't meditate like as, as I should, but I, I do now have like, you know, you said you wake up and you do the meditation, you get into the zone. I wake mm -hmm. up and I go work out. <laughs> like that's what I do now. I leave the house to work out now, actually. I know you've been to my house and you saw the gym downstairs, but it's something about going to lifetime fitness and seeing other people struggle uh, <laughs> that, make, that makes it that makes it a little bit more real. Uh, but no, I like that, man. All right. So all right, let's get started, man. Uh, what do you want to start with? So I always I'll start it's Tuesday. I'll start my, my two cents for for today. Um, so drops. So for for my two cents for today is if your why is not strong enough, your your resistance against quitting will be weak. So mm -hmm. this kind of goes in line with what we talk about. So I, I took from you and during my recovery, you told me to create a wins list and, and a why uh, and a why why list. So. Um, just from my personal experience in overcoming the stroke, it was, you know, my why had to be significant because if it was just money, if it was just something like, oh, these the material things, then I don't think I have the drive. So for me, my biggest why was my, my family. So I remember one of the main things I'm in a hospital and your, your mom hosts, uh, you know, uh, the 4th of July every year. Mm -hmm. And I'm I, the only time that I really care I'm like man I just want to get home so I could be around my family I didn't care what time it was or how long it took me my goal was I want to be home and out of the hospital by the time that rolls around so I could see my family waking up every day in the hospital seeing my wife there my mom there and talking to my different relatives you know so my why was was pretty, pretty strong. So I had no will to, you know, quit on myself. I think a lot of things, if your why is not strong enough, you'll be easily deterred from what the end goal might be. You know, there's going to be resistance there, but your why has to be stronger than that resistance. So you don't get knocked off your spot. And here's this other thing. Sometimes your why will change. It does. <laughs> like, so, and that's the other thing. It, and it's cool to have a why to get you to a certain point. And then your why will change to have you keep going, right? So 
if it's like working out, like you might be trying to lose weight to get married right now. Cool. But after you get married, maybe you want to keep the weight off because now you want to do a show or something like that. So it's I think a lot of people also have issues when their why changes and they feel like uh, do they want to start all over again? But if you like you just mentioned, if you got that why and you got that North Star, you should be straight. You should be straight. Yeah. I, even in business. Right. Even if you the reason why you start a business, it can be totally different from why you stay in that business. Right. And I even had to come to like that realization, like because at a certain point you're going to be OK financially, but then maybe your why shifts to legacy. Maybe your why shifts to making sure your kids, kids, kids are good and so on and so forth. And that may be totally different from why you started your business or why you started Toro or Airbnb or whatever you're doing. You might be on your job right now and you're looking at Toro and you might be thinking, oh, if I just make two thousand dollars and then you go make that two thousand dollars and you have to figure out a whole nother why. So either your why needs to be extremely stronger or you need got to be comfortable with it changing as well. That is That's why I kind of it. But now it's a pretty good two cent Tuesday, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm trying to drop some some bars. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> some, All some right, so <laughs> uh, we we gotta get into it now. You know, your boy, your boy didn't bought Twitter, man. How you feel about that? Um, so I, I mean, you know, I've, I've been sitting back watching. It's pretty pretty interesting because first he was going at you know uh, buying the stakes, and then he didn't want anything to do with it, and then he actually went out and and, and bought it. So, um, it's a it's a no, a different number of different angles that I think um you could look at. One is it is he you know did he buy it for for the data? That's one thing I'm seeing. Hmm. Um you know, to, to take stake in, in a platform where you can go, if you take the angle, Hey, I want to promote free speech. And then you get, you continue to build subscribers and, and take that information. And then you can do whatever you could be like the Googles and apples and, and just have the data. So it's a number of different angles. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see how it's all going to play out. What are your, what is your take on it? Well, I just posted a. Uh, I was looking on um, Black people Twitter because they're funny. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to do a quick screen share. They said, "Great value, Lex Luthor hair plugs, Lex Luthor and supercuts, Lex Luthor." Um, so <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, and there was another little meme that came up as well. Somebody says he he bought it because he was getting bullied on Twitter. So he said, guys, buy instead of just canceling his account, he going to buy Twitter. That was the other little meme that someone else mentioned as well, which I thought was funny. Here, here it is right here. He says, uh, <laughs> Elon Musk spent $43 billion to stop getting buddy on Twitter. We could have simply just been less annoying and less insane. So this is the other one. So he literally was getting, I don't know. So I, you know what I like about this whole thing? I like the billionaire beefs about this whole thing, because then Bill Gates said something and then uh, Bezos says something and I'm going to get into like my thoughts on the Elon thing as well. But I think what Jeff Bezos said was kind of interesting. If you look at Tes Tesla stock, I believe like the second largest shareholder or no, not sh shareholder, but the second place they produce the most cars is China. So now Bezos was like, huh. I wonder if China will now have some form of say on how uh, things will go over at Twitter now that Elon owns it and they actually buy the second most or the third most cars from him and so on and so forth. So that was an interesting thing. But outside of him filling stuff off his bucket list and going to space and doing all these other things, I was looking at. I was looking at how he purchased it. I thought that was swaggy. And I think it was, it was it's a lesson in how extremely wealthy people buy stuff. So Elon Musk has secured a twenty five point five billion of fully committed debt and margin loan margin loan financing, and is providing an approximate twenty one billion equity commitment for Twitter. He didn't spend a dime of his own cash to get this done. He leveraged Tesla shares, and from my understanding. He's going to keep up to, I guess, 2,000 shareholders, whoever there's private. So like uh, the original creator of Twitter might keep his shares. And that's how you're going to pay for the rest of the transaction. So he literally, he bought this thing with, with no money, no money down. And people tell you that debt is bad or you should pay stuff in cash where billionaires literally don't pay for anything in cash at all. 
So if you remember like a few shows back when I was saying like, if you have stock and you don't want to sell it, da, 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 all he did was just leverage his Tesla shares <laughs> to buy to buy Twitter and then leverage other people's share who, who, who wants to maintain their shares to come up with the rest of the money, which I just thought was insane. So he has like this infinite loop of cash because he can just keep leveraging his assets over and over again. So if he leveraged Tesla to buy Twitter, then he can leverage Twitter to buy whatever the hell else he wants and never pay taxes. I thought that was just so freaking cool how he broke how that like occurs. So what so what do you so my question to you and everybody here is like is is debt and leverage the cheat code to wealth and power? That's how I kind that's the first thing that came to my mind. Right. Oh, for- yeah, from from what I'm seeing and what I'm learning, I do think that it is. Um, and it's the what I'm learning is the type of debts that you you occur, you know, is the important thing. We're used to hearing student loan debt, you know, debt for a mortgage, debt for um, the for the car. Uh, but here, you know, he's taking out a debt and leveraging you know, assets to then purchase something that can then that has a chance to make him more money or he can leverage that thing again down the line. So I do and avoid you know, taxes. Um, so I do think that is somewhat of a cheat code to, to, um, to power and wealth, in my opinion. So the only thing is when he goes private, right, how is he going to then, only thing I think of is because if he takes it private, then it's, it's no longer public. How can he leverage Twitter at that point. That's why I'm not sophisticated enough to, to truly know. But to break it down how he did this, right? So he, uh, let's just break down the math. He's outlined $13 billion in bank financing secured by the social media company and $12.5 billion backed by a pledge of some of his uh, $170 billion in Tesla stake, right? So he basically took a collateral loan against Tesla and then he has some bank financing to pull it off as well. Cool. So the other thing is he, he still has some gaps. He has other investors he can use, right? So mm-hmm. private, private equity is limited. Private companies are limited up to uh, fewer than 2,000 shareholders. So Jack Dorsey can be involved with this. Um, and Dorsey stake is like $1 billion. Um, so anybody who has a, a considerable amount of Twitter shares can be involved with this. Another thing they mentioned is he says they said he can sell some stakes. So, so if Musk can't round up the other equity investors, he has the financial firepower to go mostly alone, thanks to his crown jewel of enormous fortune, his Tesla. So he can sell more Tesla shares to come up with the money. And then they mentioned something about cash and crypto. So if you factor in his crypto, he can even leverage his crypto or sell his crypto to finish this deal as well. I'm just really curious on what happens to Twitter once he fully has control, though. Right. So it's kind of like, does it remain Twitter how it is? Uh, I, I didn't think they kind of hurt free speech. Or I think I've, I've seen some real sketchy stuff out there. Does he live it just be the wild, wild west? Uh, like, that's my thought. That's my question to you. Like, what, what do you think happens to Twitter once he has full control and the deal is already done? Do you think it stays the same? Do you think he makes any changes at all? I think one of the things that they were mentioning him, him changing was the the authentication of like real people. So hmm. Twitter has a lot of like bots and things. I mean, any any of the social platforms has has bots. So I think that's one of the things he wanted to clean up to try to make sure that a lot of the users were actually people. Um, but as far as, you know, what do I think it'll be? I mean, I think it it could be the while if we're talking about free speech and that's what the the point of this thing was it can become like the wild wild west but is that something that you want to take on and be the face of and just at the stature that that he is that's what that's the other question i had because it's kind of like okay i understand you're a smart guy you're a genius not many people can run like what he did with tesla as far as their what they made is ridiculous like that's insane what he did over the revenue that they bring in and what he has done. But isn't like, when do you say enough is enough? <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> you're going to like, you're still fighting this fight with Tesla. You're still fighting this fight with the space program. You're still fighting these other little fights with the governments and all these other things. And then you're just going to add Twitter. 
onto the top of this. Like, like your day just isn't, isn't full enough. Right. So the other thing I wanted to look at here, let's look at the Tesla stock. They beat earnings, but they went from, and, and this is from April 5th to April 26th, right? So within a 21 day span, 1100 to 876. Oh, sheesh. You know, um, in, in, this is a big red candle on the day, right? This dropped from almost a thousand dollars all the way down to 876 in the day off the news that you just got to go ahead to move forward with Twitter. So at what point do you say, Hey, I got to focus on the main thing. I got to keep the main thing, the main thing versus, you know, chasing waterfalls over here and yes. want to be a champion of free speech over there and control. Like, this is pretty nasty. <laughs> like this is, this is a, a nasty drop within a 21 day span. We're pushing towards, we're going towards this previous month's low. Now, granted, of course, a lot of this stuff has to do with the economy in general and things like that. But I don't know, man. Do you think, I mean, he might have he might have bit off a little bit more than he can chew if you if Tesla is is the staple EV right now. But then you have Honda, you got Toyota, you got GM. All these people are coming in with EVs. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do now? you got true competition for your main thing, even though Tesla is not a car manufacturer in total. They're more of a everything type company. But. It just makes me kind of scratch my head around the whole Twitter play. I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't, it, I think it might just be some personal thing. Like, you know, you once you, maybe his why shifted, like we just talked about, you know what I mean? You wake up like, you know what? I want Twitter, y'all. I'm just going to buy Twitter. I'm tired of y'all. <laughs> I'm tired of y'all. That is a flex though. Like, I don't like, flex. I don't like your tweets. I'm going to buy this platform. Now you got to deal with me. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's different, a little weird, but you know. Yeah, I would say that, you know, as he's you said, to his, would, oh, you know, billionaires like to add to their legacies, right? Because, you know, when he's he's gone, he can say, I got PayPal, I had Tesla, I went to the moon. He can yeah. maybe he's just adding on to his 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 legend, the legend. Like, of, to, like Tamara said, he's adding to, you know, adding to a publication company to his roster like Jeff Bezos did with the Washington Post. That's an interesting. <sighs> the Post is dead, though. Yeah, I'll, at this point, you know me. I'm like, <laughs> the post is dead. I'm like, just I get it. The main thing, the main thing. Yeah, I get it, but you know, truth be told, the post is dead. I'm just not sure if the Twitter move. Twitter wasn't making money before he purchased it. Then he takes it private. I'm all like, okay, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I guess. I guess we gonna see. I guess we all gonna see. All right, let's roll into the let's roll into the next thing. I think we spend enough time on Mister on Mister Musk. So here. Uh, we talk about legacy and, and things like that. So um, here's how to, to guarantee your kids start off with, with excellent credit. And it's something that I say a lot of people do with, within the credit space is add, add them on as authorized users as you, you, you can piggyback off of somebody's credit history. Um, and some, some cards allow you, they do have age limits, but there are a few out there. Uh, Bank of America, Capital One, and Chase, who allow you to add authorized your kids as authorized user because there's no no age uh, requirement, age minimum requirement. Um, it's a good idea. Um, one thing I would say is where I see a lot of people jump into this, but there are a few uh, things that I would say before you you do this for your kids or for anybody, make sure that it's a card that you you keep utilization below 10%. Uh, make sure you make the payments on time because just as it would impact your credit is going, it would impact your your children's credit as you're as you're trying to build it. Uh, so those are some key things that you want to um, look at before doing it. But it it'll allow your kids to use your leverage your history so then when they turn eighteen they'll already have a significant credit profile, uh, just pretty much piggybacking off what you built over the years. You know what? Uh, at first, I was completely against doing this. I was like, why would a kid need to have, you know, credit? Well, they're going to be fine. Right. And then I was I was scratch I was thinking about it. I was like, well, the same way, if you can, you should be investing for your kids into the future and so on and so forth. So just like you said, I, I think it's I think it's a no brainer, especially with certain cards. Um, you mentioned the 10 percent rule. I would even go lower than that, bro. 
I would just say if you're going to put your kid on an authorized user on some of these cards that allow you to do it. So you got Bank of America, no minimum age. Uh, Capital One has no minimum age. Chase, no minimum age. Citibank, no minimum age. And Wells Fargo has no minimum age. So you can take your two-year-old, your five-year-old, your nine-year-old and throw them on those cards. But for that particular card, only included with like one of your monthly subscriptions, right? So say you got Netflix, say you got Hulu, say you got Peloton. Have that card, say you got uh, your Capital One for Peloton, your Citibank for Netflix, and then your uh, your Wells Fargo or your Bank of America for um, Apple Music. Add your kid as an authorized user on all three of those. Cut up the cards when they come in the mail and then only use it for those subscriptions. Right. So if you're only charged, say you have a, you know, if you got a ten thousand dollar limit and you're only charging. Twenty dollars a month and you pay it off in full. It's going to look great, excellent on your credit, and excellent on your kids' credit. Now, after six months, or say you say I've done I've done this with Kinsley and Olivia. After it takes about six months of reporting to build a credit profile. So after six months, that's when they the score should generate. But ideally, what a lot of people don't realize is your credit score is a byproduct of five things: paying on time, your utilization percentage, how long you have credit increase and um 35 30 15 10 10 increase how long you've had credit how long you had credit utilization payment history i'm missing one credit mix credit mix yeah the types of credit revolving credit hits on payment history and it hits on that revolving credit run so after six months your kid is going to generate a credit score because your credit score is only a byproduct of the data in the credit report you add them as an authorized user they can then generate a credit score and the longer they have credit, right, their AUs should impact their age a bit. The longer they have credit, the longer they've been on their AU, when they turn 18, it's going to look like, damn, this person had credit for 10 years. Now, let me ask you this, and, I'll, and this is my analogy. If you had somebody who's been driving for 10 years asked you to borrow your car versus your freshly minted 18-year-old who just got their license asked you to borrow your car, who are you more likely to lend the keys to? The person who's probably been driving for 10 years, right? That's how the banks are going to look at your child uh, when they become of age or even older. And it has a huge, huge, huge benefit to them um, when it comes to their credit and things like that. And of course, you should be having conversation with them and explaining how credit works and yada, yada, yada. But you can set them off on an amazing foot by doing that. Now, fast forward. Imagine by 18, they got that 800 credit score. Uh, you know, they go to, they end up going to college for a few years. They maintain that credit score to get out and get a nice little job. Now they can get the house. They can get the, whatever financing they need without coming to you, hopefully, because you set them up early by putting them on a, as an AU. Highly, highly recommend that you do that for those type of cars. So let me just run it down one more time. American Express, the age is 13 years old. Bank of America, no minimum age. Barclays, 13 years old. Capital One, no minimum age. Chase, no minimum age. Citibank, no minimum age. Discover, 15 years old. USA Bank, 16 years old. And Wells Fargo is no minimum age as well. So if you got kiddos, throw them on some AUs and help them out. I did that for my brother. And, you know, it was, it was a good building block, block for him once he became of age and um, helped him boot build his credit score from, from a young age. Um, so speaking of, of eight, you know, that 18, that young adult, um, range, I, I see a lot. Well, I, I read an article on um, that talks about, uh, Shaquille O'Neal and explaining why he kicks, kick, w- will kick his sons out at 18, but his daughters can stay as long as they want. It kind of outside of the between the the sons versus the daughters, it made me think that it was something that I saw a lot of growing up while we're here, you know, from friends. All right. When when I turn 18, I got to go. So something do you feel that the 18 year old, 18 year old, like when you turn 18, you got to move out ultimatum hinders the a young adult's chances for success? Yes. (laughs) Dude, you just go into your prom. Right. You don't know nothing about no bills, no budgeting, no no real life. Honestly, from the age of 18 to probably around 27, you don't know much about nothing. You don't. I think you put yourself at a little dis- he's put I think it, it will hurt them 
more than it helps them by just kicking them out, forcing them to the wolves. Like to me, that's crazy, especially, especially in my opinion, this is my opinion, especially coming from a wealthy background like Shaq. Think about it for a second. I'd have had a chef. I had a maid. I would had the best trainers. I had the best of everything. Right. And then 18, you like, yo, it's cut off. That's totally different from somebody who grew up in the inner city who had to learn how to cook, who had to learn how to fend for themselves, who had to learn how to do all these other things. If I think for the extremely wealthy, privileged kids doing that, I don't know. That's a bit tough. I don't know. That seems silly to me. Like I, I was I was trying to understand the logic behind it. I, I don't personally get it. Um. I grew up in that environment, like you just mentioned, like, hey, when, I, when I'm 18, I can't wait to get out. But like we said before, why was we rushing to pay bills? That was crazy to me. It's even <laughs> crazier as a parent thinking about it like right now, like if Olivia wanted to stay, if Olivia and Kinsley want to stay until they 25, 28, 29, that's cool. You know, come. this is, this is why we, we set things up. I ain't going to kick you out into the wolves. And now you got mental health issues because that's a problem as well with right. a lot of the millennials. And, and kids like, no, nah, no, nah, I think that's crazy. So wh- what's your stance on it? I, I, I couldn't understand it either. Um, you know, uh, for, for me, I'm a lot of kids at 18. I was going off to college. I didn't even know what I wanted to major in. So I, what do I, I don't know what I want to do in life. What, what do I want to be um, in high school? You take what the out, aptitude tests to mm-hmm. tell you, OK, be an engineer. I went to school. I'm like, okay, this engineering thing ain't for me. So I got to figure it out. And uh, at that time I was in, I played college basketball. So that's where my focus was. So, uh, yeah, saying, all right, get out. Then I got to figure out life on top of trying to get my education on top of playing the sport. I wouldn't have been prepared. And I don't think I will have the knowledge that I have today. So I do think that it sets, it forces the you know anybody put in that position to grow up sooner than they re- really have to just at what at 18 okay the the main thing you you can vote in what buy a pack of cigarettes if, if necessary you can't even buy a buy a bottle of liquor if, if you if you wanted to so Which is why crazy because you can go to war though yeah right <laughs> right i can go sign i could go sign you go to a recruiting center sign my life away uh to go to war you know, but I, I think, yeah, you know, everybody grows up. If you have that mature 18 year old, I don't say you you have to kick them out. But I think if they're mature enough, hey, I'm going to take them to see what the world has to offer. OK, but if you need to stay, the door is open until you figure this thing out and you feel comfortable going out there. So let me just add on to this. Do you, do you think there is an age where you would kick your child out? I don't think it's an age where I where I would, especially after experiencing what I went through two years ago. I think that I value family that much more and community that much more. Now, for me, it would be if you aren't doing anything productive with yourself, then, you know, we have to have this conversation. But if you're you're on the on a, on a good path and doing things and bringing ideas to the table and going out and bettering yourself. Why would I slow that down? I want to want to send you off with the best opportunity to succeed that I can. Hmm. See, I, I agree with you on that point as well, because it's like the longer you stay, the more maybe the family unit can move together with something. Right. Because then we can all take care of each other. You can you know, if, if your kids are with you longer then you can possibly do additional things that you may not have to, that you couldn't do around the house and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why I, I thought that it made sense to get out there and leave and be super. That that's a scam. It is. It's just a scam, Let me get out dog. here, pay bills. <laughs> Let me get a car. Like so other, co- could... <laughs> other cultures don't do that. Like no. I think about it. Like you have other cultures. Like I, I have some people who are of, of Indian descent, of Mexican descent. They, it ain't no kick you out at 18. Nope. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I understand there's going to be some difficulties though, right? Because if your kid is there and y'all bumping heads over certain things, cool. But does the good outweigh the bad? That, that's the other side of the coin. Does the good outweigh the bad the longer that the, the kids are at the home? Hmm. And from, I don't from agree our with perspective, I don't agree with kicking kids out at 18. That's crazy. I, 
Yeah, I don't either. Um, so move, moving on to, to the next thing, which we, we touched on on education a little bit. So what I, I've been reading that many employers are ditching the four year degree re- requirement. So and this some is com- crazy because they told you you needed a college degree to be anything anything like <laughs> when I <laughs> the, to, so a couple of jobs that I had you know renting cars and then working for Verizon one of the requirements was you had to have a four-year a four-year degree I'm like to to offer cell phone service or to rent a car why uh these are this is something that I can learn so in the article it was a young man who was in co- community college or the state school and he was offered an apprenticeship for a company um, with the company. And then upon completion of the program, he would then that then turn into a job offer, um, mm-hmm. which would save him significantly. So a lot of employers are opting out of the, the four year uh, degree requirement and going with your skills, the skills over over the, the degree, the degree t- is is a textbook, you know, it's textbook material for, for me. I'd rather have someone who's willing to learn that has the knack to learn and the, the, the drive and determination. Hey, if I teach you this, OK, I might have to show you a couple of times, but eventually I know you'll get it. And I think that's how you get the, the best employees versus the way companies do it now is let me take a look at your resume, see if you have like this what what roles you you had in your career versus the are you willing to to learn are you are you going to show up that's half the battle that person with that that pristine uh resume they might you they might have attendance issues and you you know uh or they might not be able to pick up the material that you're trying to show so i think that I've always been um, a person that believed that the the skill should outweigh that that piece of paper. And, it, and interesting uh, enough, the only time I see, well, I used to be IT security manager for uh, federal government and contracting, and it's weird how contracts work because the contracts will specify that your program manager needs to have this degree, this how many years of experience, and these certifications, right? And then you need to have certain key members of the staff, maybe a certain percentage of the staff need to have certain requirements as well. But everybody else, that's where you kind of made your money. Right? Mm-hmm. So I would say about 90 percent of my team was made up of people who actually knew how to do the work, but didn't necessarily have the college degree. I had a lot of people who had associate's degrees. I had a lot of people who had high school diplomas, but who knew how to uh, write policy, who knew how to uh, uh, do things with routers and secure them and ensure them and ensure things like that, where they were better than the people who played the game and spent all the money going to college and so on and so forth. So the interesting thing about this article as well, it says researchers analyzed more than 51 million job listings looking for four-year college degree requirements. In 2017, 51% required a degree. By 2021, that share declined uh, to 44%. So if you look at the trajectory of things, everybody who got these four-year degrees eventually is going to be like 20% or 15% of the jobs need a degree, and then you're not going to need it at all, which is pretty cool. So the change is most visible for middle school positions defined as those requiring some post-secondary education or training, but less than a four-year degree. But it's just a start. Of the middle skill job descriptions, the researchers reviewed that 37% showed no decrease in degree requirements, which means that 15.7 million people have effectively been wild out of the candidate pool. So when you have an issue of college tuition costing too much, and you have people who are in need, or you have jobs who have people who don't want to go to work, of course, they're going to strip that degree requirement, degree requirement, because they need people to come work with them. Um, So it's interesting that what a lot of companies are doing is, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Walmart thing that we talked about, right? When they were talking about paying truck drivers up to Mm $100,000. And how were they getting people? They were making them Right. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like if you go into some of these jobs like Accenture or or Walmart or uh, Apple or Microsoft and they train you appropriately, they built you 
uh, they fix you according to their culture, right? So if you come in at a low level, I can train you to where I want you to be. So essentially it's making them much, much stronger to, instead of having to deal with people with degrees and so on and so forth, I could just train you how I want you to train you coming in. It's no different than like McDonald's university as well. You can have all the degrees in your, in the world for them. You still got to go through that university to learn how to run that store. Yeah. So I kind of like it, but it sucks for student loans and stuff like that. Unless, mm -hmm. unless do you think this will have downward pressure on the cost of formal education? I do. Um, because if this becomes a new way of, of the new standard for for uh, corporations, I think it definitely is going to deter people. It's going to change people's mind about education. As far as okay, I can go be an apprentice, or I can just go to community college and then start my career off from there. And I won't necessarily have no debt or low debt. Um, and then I think that puts. As the number as that happens, I think the enrollment in four year university decreases, which then it will bring down the pricing on uh, university four year universities and things like that. Um, I mean, it's, it's some jobs, of course, that we know you can't get around going to going to college for being a doctor, a lawyer, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. That that's just what it is. Um, but again, for for people who aren't interested in those fields, you know, I think this is a good a good start this could be a helping uh a helping thing to kind of swing momentum to lowering uh college education and putting downward pressure on that on that sector i hope it does i, I hope it really does because there's no reason why it should cost a hundred thousand dollars to go to any school that's at just great that's just crazy to me i don't i don't i can't wrap my head around that at all and it's, it's I just I just don't get it. <laughs> I just don't get it. All right. So uh, I think Google's doing something too, involving this also. Right. Yeah. Google, they're um, they're launching a fund to uh, of a billion dollars in partnership with um, what, what company was that? I think it's social finance. So, uh, yeah, I believe it's like a yep, social finance. training partner. So what they're doing is they're they're investing into helping people get cert certifications and certificates to help them uh, through a low cost program where it's student friendly as far as pricing and repayment options mm -hmm. versus the, the college route. So Google is getting in on it, which is pretty big. You know, we, we know who Google is. So um, if they if that works out and they have Google's backing, who knows what other tech companies or what other, other companies, because I believe the tech industry is being impacted significantly, which is causing this, uh, these, uh, the tech companies to look into this and to take some action. I mean, most of, most of the, the, the tech companies don't hire based off degree anyway, they hire based off skill set and IQ and, and knowledge in that regard. Right. So it, it didn't, it doesn't necessarily make sense for Google to have a four year requirement, but I like their putting a billion dollars towards training people. Right. So you, so you can go train at, get a certificate at Google and go through everything like that. And I believe the scenario was like, uh, you can pay us back if you end up finding a job over 40 grand or some crap like that, Yeah, um, it was a which is an interesting dollars. play, right? Because we just talked about this. Then we have a, a like a, a week or so, a few weeks ago that that lady who went to her son went to that college and he got like some plan where they got to pay it back based off his salary or something like that. Like his school was free, but he had to pay back 100 yeah, grand based off to, his salary. Um, yeah, he had to. um it was an agreement with the school that um, at the end of when he got a job that it would be, I think it was income shared agreement or income something shared like that. agreement. That's what it was. So and it kind of reminded me of that, which I was like, eh, I don't really like that. You know, it reminds me of modern day sharecropping type yeah. scenario, but um, it'd be interesting if this would be the new way of higher education, right? Cause a certificate program is generally specific to a certain thing right now and it's more mm -hmm. up to date it's not general information right it might just be about a programming language it might be say about facebook ads it could be about google ads it could be about anything like that that's current in the now 
So I'm assuming this particular education program is going to change based off the needs that Google will need, that Apple will need, and Microsoft will need, and so on and so forth. So I kind of like it um, also. But anything that reduces or eliminates the cost of student loans, I'm here for it. Like, right. <laughs> I, I think that's the biggest, that was the one of the biggest scams and lie outside of medical uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that's been uh, driven to the public. Right. So um, one one and talking about work in, in the workplace, I just wanted to touch on this real quick. So I've seen that there was a four day work week pilot program um, that's going to be underway in the U.S. and in Canada, um, where it's it's a four day on three day off uh, hmm. kind, kind of balance. So is this something that you think will help with work life balance and uh, employee burnout that we've been seeing over the last bit of time since the the pandemic yes and no it, it truly depends on what you do on your day off right you can be completely i think a lot of people get burnt out because they speak to this to the black screen too often right? yeah. <laughs> like yeah. when they wake up and they're in their phone and they go to bed in their phone and living their life on on facebook instagram tiktok and so on and so forth and you get more burnt out from this than than your job it's like this is pressure like the dings and like so I don't think it really changes much. I think people are just going to have more time for their bad habits. That is true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know it's a weird take. On, it's a weird take on it, right? I don't. Unless you truly just like hate your job, then cool, I, I get it. But some people like their job and they still be miserable. Well, why is that? It's something else. It's something. It's, they're not taking the care of them themselves. Uh, they're not taking care of their mental health or their physical health, right? And even if I give you, if you got Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, are you really going to take that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, contribute it to mental health or no? Right. Like, that, are, are you going to actually spend time to take care of yourself? Right, right. So that's where I was thinking from. So I, I always try to remove myself from, from the thought process because what you said, that is a good point. And where I was thinking was just that, okay, for, for in my shoes, I'm like, three days four days on three days off okay extra day to take care of myself do what i need to do but then everybody don't think like that but so, you already doing it though right <laughs> that's that's fun. you're doing it already though like you wake up like all right i'm gonna meditate to the oh i'm tired i'm take a break to the if, if you've never done that how do you how do you get people who've never done that to do that like you will have to probably have you have to mandate like hey you're getting paid for for Friday and the job requires me to go to the gym on Friday or go to the sauna or to take a break or meditate or something like that. Like in the beginning, you probably you have to teach people how to take care of themselves in the beginning until they un, they fully understand it. Right. Like right. If, if the habit's not there, they're not going to do it. That right? is that is true. Because if you you just going to fill that empty space with whatever thing that you you're gonna use friday to do grocery shopping and, sh and stuff like that like that's what you're mm. gonna use it for yeah. um so I, I would rather them if they implement it then there has to be uh, i would say these same companies should implement some form of training or some form of education around why it's important because a lot of people truly don't know that it's important right like yeah. you didn't i truly didn't learn about nutrition until i got older i'm like damn imagine if i was drinking a gallon of water uh, when I was running track or if I was getting eight hours of sleep, if I was getting the proper amount of protein in my system, or if I knew how to do macros and micro, if I knew about macros and micros when I was a collegiate athlete, I'll be dangerous. Right. But I didn't know that. Right. You you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, I was in the, in the same boat. Yeah, I didn't learn this stuff until until I got older. Life happened. I was, you know, college basketball player running around eating whatever. Don't you know you if I, <laughs> right. If so I knew, this goes back to the Ocho versus science. So you really think you was going to be able to eat McDonald's and still get 40 off at that time? Yeah. <laughs> now? Absolutely not. See, That's a real quick. No, let me get some spinach or uh, some, some chicken. <laughs> but, uh, but, but on a serious note, four day week, five day week to me, it don't matter. I, I look at more so performance. Like, can you get the, the work that's needed to be done within a day? Like even when we talk, like uh, we was talking to uh, Tyron, he's like, ah, oh, you know, I want to meditate. Why are you not meditating then? Right. Why are you not, <laughs> why are you not taking a break? And it's like, it's not like, 
Like, I'll be like, yo, you're not at your desk. No, if you, if you need something for yourself, mental, mental, your, your, your physical and your mental health is utmost important, right? Because when you have that, then everything is easy. Work is easy. It's you taking care of yourself. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Yep. yep. And I think yep. a lot of people don't take that in consideration. They don't think they can take care of themselves, right? So if they don't think that, even if you give a four-day weekend or a three-day weekend, I'm sorry, they're not going to take care of themselves. And they're they going to be oh, we need two days off. All right. Uh, what was the next one? So the final thing <laughs> here is, is yeah, this, this is, is a, this is a funny one. So with all the talk NFTs, the digital space, blockchain, do you think that people are going to go into debt buying clothes and oh, yes. and things for their for their digital avatars? Yes, um, absolutely. So let me give you, let me give y'all the background on this. So I was reading an article and it says that Nike Nike NFT sneakers for the metaverse are selling for 8k. <laughs> so for eight thousand uh, dollars, Nike has launched uh, a digital virtual sneaker design uh, and collection, and people are paying between seventy five hundred and nine thousand, which equals to about two and a half to three ether um, for for these shoes. So. My take on it is we had Grand Theft Auto. We had, you know, um, like NBA 2K, my player, where you can kind of go in and make money to then dress your, your character the way that you want them to. And this was before you, you used your own money. You were using the money of the game. Now the game has seemed to become its own, like, real world. So um, and with this the cryptocurrency and the digital currencies, I absolutely believe you that people are going to go into debt. They're going to want to buy property to be next to the best of the people in, in that space. They're going to want to look the swaggiest. Um, so I absolutely think that uh, people would, would be willing to go into debt for, for something like this. One, it's, you know, it may be something that you know you might not be able to do in, in real life, or you do have that that designer taste in real life. And let me just touch on the sneaker part, right? I'm a sneaker person. I like sneakers. I wear them. But you got people that buy sneakers to put them in a closet or a warehouse for just to say they got them. Yeah. And this is the same thing. Without having to buy the physical item, you can get an NFT, which everybody thinks is the hottest thing is going, you know, I'd rather have the sneaker because then I can go to consignment and actually physically sell it for some money right. rather than hope that maybe I can sell this NFT to somebody else um, and, and get some money for it. But I do think that people But you, but you gonna, mentioned, you mentioned uh, Grand Theft Auto, you mentioned NBA 2K, my player, right? People spend real money to buy oh, those Oh yeah, things, that is right? true. So, yep. so if, if you played any of the role-playing games uh world of warcraft people spend money for armor and all that stuff so nfts technically have been around if you play Fortnite, people spend uh, money for the skins and things like that so uh, by all means i i just don't understand the eight thousand dollars part that's the part that's just throwing me <laughs> off like okay all right so your digital guy is going to wear these Nike dunks where they only made 20 digital versions of them. So that's the part I don't get. Like maybe I'm ignorant to it right now and I don't get it. But 8K, 8,000 US dollars. Come on, bro. That is crazy to me. I could have it like that. And I'm still not paying $8,000 for a, a metaverse sneak, a, a real sneaker, a metaverse sneaker, none of it. <laughs> oh, like eight, like maybe I don't get it. I'm all like eight grand. Wow. So may, maybe there's something I missed. I know they mentioned, oh, there's some cool things you can do. Like you can use a, a filter and you can make it seem like you're wearing them in real life. But okay, it's just a digital overlay over your Crocs. So I don't get that. I don't get the eight thousand dollar part. I. I I don't know. Maybe, maybe a little bit down the line when your avatar can do stuff, maybe. But I think people are going to be going crazy spending money on designer for a digital thing. 
yeah, for, and then for, for, was... for their sim for their for their sim <laughs> version of themselves. You gonna they you gonna see people with the loot because I see it in um Grand Theft Auto. People have all types of designer on and Grand Theft Auto and things like that. Well, and I'm all like, they probably paid a lot of money to look a certain way in a, in, a, in the game. I just hope just make sure you take care of real life before you put 8K on some some sneakers. Because the other thing is, if you look at the NFT world now, a lot of the stuff is, is illiquid. So a lot of the things that people purchased in 2021 when NFTs and crypto was going crazy, they can't sell them now, right? It's no different than that guy who bought Jack Dorsey's tweet for the very for the, the founder of Twitter. He had his, his tweet, his first tweet he bought, like, I think he purchased it for, how much does he purchase that tweet for? Let me look it up. Jack Dorsey tweet, NFT price. He bought it for 2.9 million, right? He tried to sell it recently. At first he was like, yeah, I'm going to try to sell it for 25. I think he was like 25 million. He was going to donate it to charity and so on and so forth. Oh, it went on sale for 48 million. So a crypto entrepreneur spent 2.9 million last year for Jack Dorsey's first tweet. He put it up for sale for 48 million. The most it got as a bid was $280. I don't know what math y'all like or know of, but 2.9 million to $280 is crazy. Man. And a lot of the NFTs are going to be like that. Because it was a bubble, right? When it was hot, just like with crypto, anything you would have bought in crypto in, in 2020, 2021, so on and so forth, it went up crazy. Dogecoin, SafeMoon, all these places. Now, let a year go by, let stuff sit a little bit, and then people start to, to realize, and, and the economy goes down a little bit like that. Now you're 2.9 million turns of $280. What do you think these NFT sneakers are going to turn into? That's exactly <laughs> what do you think your What do you think your board ape going to turn into? That's exactly why I said I'd rather had a real shoe than the digital shoe, because at least I know somebody going to buy it, not as opposed to the, the digital shoe. But yeah, that's well. The, the weird thing about NFTs is just like art, right? Mm -hmm. the, the the value is perceived, right? So a lot of people will say, "Oh, why don't you just buy art?" There's no utility in art. That's what the NFT guys will argue. There's no so. Lots of people, when they buy the NFT, what's the utility? What does it do? Well, what does the painting on the wall do? It don't do anything either. But the value, the perceived value of that uh, Rothko is way higher than that first tweet or those digital sneakers and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And the other part I don't get is like, okay, if the NFT crowd says that, well, NFTs are art, why don't you just buy real art? Like there's less than 30% of the art in the world is actually owned by private individuals why don't you just spend your money and buy some of that rare art that's out there that already exists i don't know maybe i'm maybe I'm, I'm tripping maybe i don't get it yet but i've been digging very hard to figure out this nft stuff and these eight thousand dollar sneakers and digital clothes for your avatar just don't make no sense to me yeah i don't get it either it's crazy crazy and if you go on openc.com you look at some of these nfts and you look at like uh, what they were purchased for and what they are trying to sell for now outside of the people who are just transferring them to each other. You'll see that a lot of them drop a crap ton in value. Like they're, they're only worth what people are willing to pay for them. And um, a lot of them aren't worth a third or 10th of what they people purchase for these things as well. But pretty good show. Do we have any questions that see, we need to get to? Um, Regina has her hand up. Let's promote Regina up. See what she wants to talk about. Let's allow her to talk. Hey, Regina. We can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yay. Okay, cool. So I had a very specific question mm -hmm. um, based on like, uh, you know, your do-it-yourself academy. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, you said that if there's, uh, I should pay down my loan. I have a, a personal loan. I've had it for almost three years. And you said we should pay it down to a dollar. But um, it's on auto pay. That was part of uh, the, the requirements. And I, I paid it like eight months in advance. But I was like, wait, 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 I was supposed to hold on for it. So I, that way I have a, 
uh, it's the only um, that kind of loan in the mix. Uh, all the rest is revolving credit. By the way, since using your program, FYI, I went from 500. My high score is now 789. Nice. Um, yeah, nice. today I, it was. I was like, "Whoa!" In a year and a half, it took a while. But, but you got that eight hundred though, so now you can co-sign. Seven eighty nine. It's not eight <laughs> yet, but it's almost there. Yeah. But if that, you co-sign for me and you get me this house, I feel as though <laughs> in your spirit that you'll feel better. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right. So, did so, you want to? Did you want to know why the dollar thing, or were you no, trying no, to no. figure so, out how? So how do dollar? I do that? Like, I want like this loan isn't actually due until three years after, which was okay. like two and a half years ago. But the thing is that, um, uh, does does the mix like okay? Uh, so there's an alternate question on this is does that mix does it have to be live like if I paid it off because it's coming due on the 30th which is what like uh, three to four days from now right it's going to automatically come out of my account but um, if I uh, pay it off is that still in the mix for seven years or it's not as good if it's live as so if, if it's, you know. it, it, it will be but what okay. happens is they're no longer going to report the on-time payment each month that's one right. Number two, it starts mm -hmm. the clock for it to be removed. So typically items that were paid off in full that were in good standing mm -hmm. will stay on your credit report for seven years plus 180 days up to 10 okay. years. Okay. If you delay it, if you pay it down to a buck, right? And you just let this thing go to the end of its term, then you are extending how long it stays on your credit report. Um, so if they have, though, a minimum, you know, it's like $85 a month and they're automatically taking out of my account, should I call them and say I want to hold off on on, on and only pay but, like 84? Well, you paid, you, so let me let me understand. You paid this. You paid it all the way down to a dollar or you paid it up? No, for three I years? paid it down to um, 80. It's it's something like 84.92. So I, I really I tried to keep it longer as I realized, uh oh, this is good in the mix. This is the only one I have in the yeah. mix with this. So, so, so the um, next payment pretty much pays it off and then it's going to show up yes. as closed then. Right. So yeah. what I would are you able to tell them to take it off auto pay? Uh, it's lending club. I'm not sure. Oh, I, I don't, you may not be able to do yeah. that with lending club since it's like a personal loan thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, but reach out to them and ask like, Hey, okay. uh, this is coming due, but typically with lending club places like prosper, that's like mm -hmm. a, a peer to peer lending where the is lending club peer to peer lending. Where you, um, you I don't have, know. Like, They're out of San Francisco. I'm not sure. You might have had like mm -hmm. 10 people sourcing it, so they might have an automatic payment schedule that comes out. Mm -hmm. But I would just reach out to them and see if that's something that uh, if you paid it down to one dollar, would they re keep it open and take a the dollar later? Okay, I right on. Ask. I mean, and, and I'm even willing to, you know, obviously pay the interest rate, which I hate, but it's like, okay, well, I need this in my mix. Well, but, I would say uh, interest of the like, 10 percent of a dollar is it's not that much. Right, 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 right. Right. 30. It's a 30 percent one. And it really bugged me looking at it. But but at the same time, I need it in my mix and it, it helped keep my credit up. So if it were paid off, um, is that still considered? Would that still be good for my mix or would it no longer because it's it, not live? It, it will still be on your credit report and it still will count. Okay. Um, it just right won't on. be as impactful okay. as if a that account was mm -hmm. reporting on time payments each month. Now it's a okay. personal loan, right? So it's an installment right. loan. So do you have right. any auto loans, any student loans, no. any mortgages? Well, I, I, my student loans are like from decades ago. So so they're kind of, um, uh, they could rear their ugly heads, but uh, but they're like from like three decades ago. So, uh, you know, um, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm I, uh, politicking for them to uh, <laughs> negate these things when okay. they were before bankruptcy but you know like from three dec i mean they are from three decades ago so okay. um so uh but so there's nothing no install there are no installment loans right now that i have i'm looking to buy a house that'll be an installment loan but i until i get it i i've had it's a seller's market i've had right. four offers I, I my realtor didn't go high enough even though i was like oh let's go higher she's like oh no no you you, you has to make the appraiser value and and it, we didn't get it and i'm like ah. mm. so i think i might get a, another realtor but um <laughs> <laughs> i might not because she knows the she knows people but so but meanwhile um i want to make sure my mix is that my credit stays high so so i, I think i think your, your credit will be fine you might take a small little dip once it closes but um 
I would say just reach out to Lending Club to see if you can do the dollar method. Hey, if I pay this down all the way down mm -hmm. to a dollar, uh, is there any way I can keep the loan open until the end of the, the loan term? Okay. Unless your loan term is coming up. Um, okay. Other than that, I think you're you're doing fine. And I would say just every three to six months, I'm sorry, every six months, don't forget to request credit limit increases on your credit cards. Um, and if you haven't, um, see if you can get inside of some credit unions like Navy Federal. Uh, Pen some Pen Pentagon Federal sent me a $9,000, which I accepted the card hasn't arrived though yet. Right. Pen so that's, that's going to that's gonna be able to help you if you can't keep that, uh, that other line open as well. Right on. Okay. Thank you. Your, your course is awesome. Congratulations on the yeah, was so, I was like, well. whoa, I've never been this high. <laughs> so so, so more important, just uh, take okay. that same knowledge and grab somebody that you love and, and show them, right? Show them how to budget, show them how to do their credit, I'm show trying. them how to invest. Some people are stubborn though, you know? That's 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 the game though. That's the game, right? That So sometimes you got to take your people with you because yes. you don't want to be the only one, you know, at, at the at, in the VIP, right. in the financial yes, VIP. Right. You're right. I'm trying, but sometimes like, like my best friend is just stubborn. He's in his seventies though. And, uh, he just like, uh, I'm like, Oh, let me open it for you here. I'll give you money for, uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, he'll come around, he'll but, come yeah. around, especially <laughs> if he sees how happy you are and, and how you're right. doing and things like that. He'll come around. Right. But once again, congratulations on the amazing score. Right. And Thank putting you it in the work. for your amazing class. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. <laughs> good talking to you good talking to you cool all right that was a good one so we're gonna end it on a high note with that one and we're over we're a bit over as well like that so um we gonna speak to you guys on tuesday the replay will be up in the next 24 to 48 hours talk See to you guys you soon on tuesday